If I could ask all the speakers for the next session uh, to come on up uh, to the stage. Uh, and in that process, um, I will give a lengthy introduction to, to Dr. to Professor Ko. Um, and uh, we didn't know each other until I started this. And he'll give you the story that I, I cold called him, basically. I got his email from another colleague, and I just really shot him a random email praying that he would respond. And I did have to send two before I got a response. But I subsequently got a response. We had a fantastic phone call. Uh, and I essentially told him, I am not doing this summit, this very first summit, unless you attend. And so, and then I picked this date because of his availability. And he has great timing because we got this in. Next week, it wouldn't have worked. Um, uh, and um, literally met him for the first time yesterday. But, you know, for Korean Americans, he is, um, he is legendary, right? He uh, is... Uh, what really, um, we are, we're extremely proud of his accomplishments. Uh, as you know, um, he's a professor um, at the School of Public Health at Harvard, but I think most people know him as uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Health in the Obama administration, played a key role with uh, Professor So in getting uh, the hepatitis B screening uh, recommendations. Uh, and I always tell people that I am following Professor So's playbook. Uh, and part of that was making sure that we got uh, uh, Howard Coe involved. Um, and then I just want to finish with one unique story about uh, Howard that I learned yesterday at dinner. Uh, he is a beyond an overachiever. Uh, he um, trained in internal medicine and then went on and was chief resident, and then went on to do a fellowship in oncology. And then if that wasn't enough, he then went on to do another uh, residency in dermatology. Uh, so he has had extensive training. Uh, he got into politics uh, by being asked to um, uh, be uh, the public health, uh, uh, what was it, the commissioner of health for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and then subsequently uh, entered the, the national scene. And so uh, we view, uh, we're excited to hear uh, what um, uh, Howard has to say on the approach to addressing health care disparities for Asian Americans. Hopefully we can apply this to uh, gastric cancer and uh, we hope to use his wisdom and his experience uh, to uh, move this field forward. So without further ado, please welcome Howard Coe. so much, Dr. Huang, for that very embarrassing introduction. It's uh, really a great honor to be here and to see this wonderful group gather together to address such an important area for health disparities in our country. And uh, the story that Professor Huang just told is true. G getting that cold call a year ago from some guy I didn't know saying, you've got to be here. This is a very important issue, and y you can help us. That that's been the beginning of this journey that we're celebrating today and to be here and now see this tremendous group of colleagues with expertise in so many areas of public health is very, very gratifying to me. Uh, I also am delighted to see some old friends. Dr. So has been mentioned multiple times and you'll be hearing from him and me a little bit on the hepatitis efforts that we, sh we shared. Uh, Dr. David Greenwald is here and he and I worked together on colorectal cancer screening and another public health collaboration. Um, and so when I look around the room, there's so many of you who have tackled uh, areas very, very important to the future health of our country. And uh, Dr. Huang asked me to give a very broad overview on the approach to addressing healthcare disp disparities for Asian Americans, an issue that's important to all of us professionally and personally. Uh, this is an area that I've been thinking a lot about since I was a young physician out of training, looking for data relevant to our population, looking for strategies relevant to our population, and initially finding absolutely nothing. So the fact that a number of years later we have care and efforts led by all of you is something that I find most inspiring. Uh, I also should say on a personal basis before I start in that the whole area of cancer prevention and screening is how I started my public health career, starting in tobacco control actually, uh, but then also in melanoma early detection and screening. So the excellent presentations I heard this morning raising the issues about screening, about who can screen, when to screen, how often, 
uh, reductions in incidence and mortality that we all strive for, the excellence uh, study design that we all strive for. Th these are themes I've been thinking about for a good part of my career. So uh, let me begin on a very personal note. Uh, it was my great honor to serve uh, this country as Assistant Secretary for Health from 2009 to 2014. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever served in government, but I never planned to be doing this when I got my MD many years ago. Uh, now I'm standing before you as a physician who served in, in state government as the Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts from 97 to 2003, and then as the Assistant Secretary from 2009 to 2014. I had the great privilege of working under two secretaries, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, seen here, was the one who swore me in. Uh, she's an extraordinarily dedicated public health professional. Uh, to work with the president as he pioneered so many health efforts, particularly including the ACA, and we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act in two weeks, so stay tuned on that. To work with the First Lady on her historic Let's Move effort uh, was something that I treasure. But I'm here today because there were tremendous efforts from the Obama administration to raise the profile of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. A-A-N-H-P-I is the acronym, actually. And so of all the photos uh, that I treasure, the one on the lower right is one that I am particularly appreciative of, and that's when President Obama in the fall of 2009 decided to resurrect the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Native, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and asked for his highest ranking Asian American appointees to stand behind him in the White House as he signed this executive order. So maybe you can see standing right behind the president is me with the blue tie and standing right to my left, the gentleman in the pink tie is my brother, Harold Ko, who at the time was the top lawyer in the State Department under Secretary Clinton. So that was a tremendous privilege and needless to say, my mother really likes this picture. <laughs> and so uh, of the many programs and efforts I was privileged to pursue as Assistant Secretary, I saw this as a, as a unique opportunity to try to do more for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. I had the great privilege on the top left of uh, meeting the historic Senator Inouye from Hawaii. He served for decades in the Senate before passing away. On the top right, a picture with then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And by the way, that very handsome guy on uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's left is my son, Daniel Ko, who was at the time Chief of Staff to the Mayor of Boston, Bar Marty Walsh. And then when you have the privilege of serving in positions like this, you get to attend not only domestic but also global uh, gatherings such as the World Health Assembly in Geneva, and it's a privilege that you'll never forget. So this White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders really raised the profile of advancing research, data collection, analysis, and dissemination for AANHPIs, ensuring access, particularly linguistic access and cultural competence, ensuring involvement in public service and civic engagement opportunities. So many heroes that I worked with in this effort. I particularly want to single out my wonderful colleague, Kieran Ahuja, who was the inaugural executive director, and many other colleagues that you can see below. On the extreme right, uh, is the current uh, executive director for this initiative, Holly Hamm, uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting her recently as well. So just to start with some basics that you all know, our population is growing. We're the fastest growing minority group in this country. It is projected that uh, by 2050, we'll have uh, perhaps some 40 million plus people in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander population. But one major message that you have heard time and again is that we have an extremely heterogeneous population. 24% Chinese American, 19% uh, Asian Indian or, or Filipino, uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese Americans, Korean Americans, I'm Korean American, and then many other subgroups as you see uh, listed here on the right. So if you add it all up, we have some 22, 23 million plus AANHPI members of our society, but there's tremendous heterogeneity, 50 plus ethnicities, 100 plus languages spoken, two thirds of us are foreign born, a third have low English proficiency. So that's why we need the best data possible, disaggregated data to try to do the best we can 
to deliver patient-centered care. Now, a couple of years ago, I and this really brilliant student at my school, Dr. John Park, and I wrote this little summary about health disparities for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and so we published this February of 2017. Uh, Dr. John Park is now a doctoral student. He's an MD uh, from Scotland, actually, but of Korean background, and now a doctoral student at our school. But as he did the literature search, um, he pointed out that there, was, there are many areas where we needed more information and more advocacy. So that actually inspired me to keep promoting research in this area now that I'm back at Harvard. And I'm going to be showing you some examples of that in just a second. But I also did reflect with him that in my journey in public service, I've come to learn that you, you have to leverage all parts of your personality if you want to, if you want to help promote the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander cause. So for example, when I was state health commissioner some 20 years ago, we had some efforts to do outreach for the Asian American population of Massachusetts with respect to tobacco control, a major, major disparity and issue for our population, especially for immigrant men. Uh, quite honestly, this is the issue that drove me from clinical medicine into policy, and so Part of that outreach was to work with communications experts to, to, to reach uh, minority populations. So here, here's one example of how they, they used my image as a commissioner. Look at the middle poster. Here I am saying in my best Korean, Tambaral Kunupshida, which means <laughs> let's quit tobacco. But I was very surprised when the consultant also showed these other posters of me saying the same thing in Chinese on the left. I don't speak a word of Chinese. <laughs> on the right, they had me on top of some temple. I, di I didn't ask to be there for that one either. And uh, so I asked the consultant, why, why did you put my picture in all these posters? And they said, well, Commissioner, we want to leverage your persona in the best way possible to help the Asian American people of Massachusetts. And I said, okay. And I never forgot that. So this theme will come up again, as you'll see a little bit later. Uh, so when I moved into government as the Assistant Secretary in the Affordable Care Act was passed now almost 10 years ago, uh, there were many dimensions of the ACA that had to do with more than gaining insurance coverage, although that is very, very important, as I'll show you in just a second. And, and here's one advance that I'm very, very proud of, so-called Section 4302 of the ACA, Updating Data Collection Standards. What did data section 4302 do? It required health surveys sponsored by the Department of Health and Human Services involving self-reported information to include additional detail for race, ethnicity, sex, primary language, and disability status. So for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, that meant instead of just checking off the broad box of Asian American, or in previous years, other, I don't know about you, but I never appreciated being in the other category. We now have all these subcategories to more accurately track our population. Asian Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and even four subgroups for Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiian, Guamanian, Chamoran, Samoan, and other Pacific Islander. So that gives us tremendous clarity in terms of understanding how various conditions affect our population and give us disaggregated data is something that we, and especially all the advocates, have been looking for for quite a while. Here's another example of how we were able to get such disaggregated data uh, for health. Many of you know the so-called NHANES study, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And if you don't know the details of this, this, this information is collected with people being assessed in this trailer and I got to visit that and uh, be hosted by some colleagues from HHS and then take a tour inside. And the NHANES staff assesses health and nutritional status through personal interviews and standardized physical examinations and laboratory measurements and then sampling uh, of all kinds. And so in 2011, NHANES be began to oversample Asian Americans for the first time, which I was really delighted about because it's hard to do informed public health intervention unless you have good, accurate 
data, and in our case, disaggregated data. And then one thing that we really celebrate about the ACA is it improved access to clinical preventive services, so-called high-value clinical preventive services. So you have heard repeatedly today about the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, USPSTF. Uh, you probably all know that because of the Affordable Care Act now, plans, health plans must cover without cost to the beneficiary high value A and B preventive services by USPSTF as well as vaccination and other preventive services shown here. So what does that mean? If you have access to the task force, and apparently you do with the chair being here on, on campus, and that's great, and you can make your case to them with the best science possible and the best studies possible, uh, hopefully at some point that group uh, can weigh in about how to advance uh, potential screening interventions. Now, of course, that data has got to be very high level, uh, very strong science with, with the best design. I think being informed by experts from Korea and Japan, like we heard this morning, uh, is, is very, very exciting. Uh, to have the publications that we, we saw reviewed this morning is also very, very exciting. So I know one of the goals of this group initially, led by our, our amazing Dr. Huang, is to see if we can get such data before the task force, have them weigh in, and see uh, what other data are needed to, to advance potential screening interventions going forward. Now let me show you some examples of Asian American health disparities that have been resolved. This, this slide I'm very, very excited to show you. And you remember my wonderful, young, brilliant colleague, Dr. John Park, once came to me after we did that little review for the JAMA Forum and said, uh, you know what, Dr. Koh, uh, I have seen no articles documenting whether Asian Americans have more health insurance coverage after the ACA uh, compared to before. And I said, what? Are you sure? And he said, yeah, I've, I've combed the literature. There, is, there are no analyses. And we were all very aware of such analyses being do, done for other minority groups. So uh, he and I and our colleagues here, Dr. Ben Summers, Dr. Graham Kolditz, Dr. Arnie Epstein, and Ms. Sarah Humble did this analysis that appeared in JAMA Internal Medicine um, two years ago. And what you can see here is that if you see health insurance coverage rates in light blue on the top, and then lower rates for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, for blacks, and then for Hispanics, you know that Hispanics have the highest rates of uninsured for multiple reasons. The rates of uninsured w went down uh, after the ACA uh, was implemented in 2010, and especially after 2014 uh, when um, the, the Medicaid expansion efforts uh, kicked in. But important to our population here is look at the second dark blue curve, the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander curve. It now, the health insurance coverage rates for our population now match that of the non-Hispanic white population. So in short, the health disparity that we used to see in our country about, for health insurance coverage has been eliminated. So that, that's big news. I mean, eliminating health disparities is really hard in any area, for any condition, for any group, but it, it appears that the ACA has done that for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander population. So we are very excited to show that and uh, demonstrate it in this brief article. Uh, you can also see through this bar chart that the percentage of uninsured by race, ethnicity, pre and post ACA went down for every major group, for whites, for blacks, for Hispanics, and for AA and HPI, as you can see here. But then here's something that we thought was really very exciting for our population. If you break it down by ethnic subgroup for Asian, Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, other Asian, and on and on, the rates of uninsured went down for every Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander subgroup that we, we could measure. So that was pretty comprehensive, pr pretty exciting. And by the way, the longer you look at data like this, other key questions come up. So one trend that I've never been able to understand is why did Korean Americans traditionally always have such high rates of uninsurance? Look, look at the pre-ACA graph here. It's almost 30%, now down closer to 13%. Lots of speculation, but I'm not sure if there's been any good study on this, but we would love to hear. 
So uh, we put that before you, and again, as the 10th anniversary of the ACA comes up, and we try to celebrate some successes, and you know, for example, that uh, that whole act is now coming before the Supreme Court this fall, a very important watershed for our country, in my view. Uh, we have to keep these successes in mind. And then uh, we, uh, our team, again led by John Park, uh, asked, how did this happen? Was it because Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in the Medicaid expansion states were the ones who particularly benefited? And you can see here that some, now some 37 states have uh, expanded uh, Medicaid. Uh, and this is as of uh, last November. So we uh, explored and did some further analyses in a study that appeared in Health Affairs just a couple months ago. So uh, there are a lot of numbers in here, but let me just tell you the high level headlines. And that is that the rates of uninsured went down very substantially for low income AA and HPI in expansion states and also for non-expansion states. So the difference in differences uh, was, was not significant. For the Medicaid expansion states, you can, you can see the dramatic um, rise in, 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 in coverage. Um, and for non-expansion states, uh, you can see a rise as well. So we can't explain exactly what's going on here. We, we, we would like to think that Medicaid expansion um, was helpful to our population, but maybe some people still uh, were scared away by trying to approach uh, government officials to try to get coverage. Uh, we know that in non-expansion states, there's lots of outreach in, in, in Asian languages to try to get people into exchanges, and maybe that's what we're seeing here. But the upshot is that we have eliminated that disparity, uh, which, is, which is good news, and we have to keep analyzing to see how we can best get people who are previously uninsured um, in, into insurance and into the healthcare system. So now let's move on to health disparities. There's so many of them. Uh, hepatitis will be mentioning many times. Uh, cardiovascular mortality, this bullet should say higher for, AA and H, for some AA and HPI subgroups, and there are colleagues here who have uh, studied this carefully. Diabetes and obesity has gotten a lot of attention, and I want to say a little bit more about that in a second. The hepatitis theme you'll be hearing uh, about a lot. Uh, we uh, put a lot of attention to the fact that some one in 12 Asian Americans have hep B. So a, a great disproportionate burden on our population, but very importantly, two out of three Asian Americans with hep B don't know they are infected. In fact, this is an issue for all chronic hepatitis that people with hep B and hep C don't even know they're infected. So step one is education and testing of some kind. Uh, we are very proud to say that we joined forces to create a HHS National Viral Hepatitis Action Plan. Dr. So was absolutely instrumental in this. We were able to bring the Hep B and Hep C colleagues together and the advocates together. We rallied around some common goals about prevention, about reducing deaths, about reducing disparities and monitoring and reporting on progress going forward. One thing I'm really proud of personally is that at the White House, we were able to institute a World Hepatitis Day that now happens annually in addition to the World AIDS Day that's been going on for quite a long time. And then if you follow the news, uh, one, one thing that we were very excited about was that Hep C baby boomer screening was implemented during that time for people ages between 45 and 65. And then just last week, uh, the USPSTF agreed to expand such screening, so, such screening for people 18 and over. On the Hep B side, Dr. Sell will tell you much more about the, uh, the screening recommendations and the vaccination recommendations as well. So we would like to think that if you get everybody together behind a plan, that, that we can make some progress here. And we would like to think that that's perhaps a model for what the gastric cancer community is trying to do right here. So I was really privileged to uh, play a role in, in all this. There was lots of outreach uh, partnerships with uh, API communities, posters in various languages, uh, public service announcements. They put me on a poster, take care of your liver, and yes, you guessed it. Uh, <laughs> all these languages, you know, so very, very happy to use any part of my persona to 
promote the message of public health. A couple comments on obesity, which is very fascinating, and I don't know if you follow this, but again, perhaps a model for us as we launch into gastric cancer early detection and potential screening issues. Uh, you may know that Asian Americans have a higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes at relatively lower uh, BMI cut points than whites for reasons that we can discuss later. So in 2015, the American Diabetes Association released a position statement encouraging diabetes testing for Asian Americans when their BMI is over 23 as opposed to over 25 for the rest of the population. So that's gotten some traction and the Asian American uh, diabetes advocates have gotten together and have worked with various groups across the country to start this Screen at 23 campaign to raise awareness and say if you're an Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, your BMI is 23 or over, maybe diabetes screening could be appropriate for you. This is still uh, very, very new, but um, you, you see some of the groups here that are trying to push this together. So if we can get all the advocates and groups working together on these various health disparity issues, it could be that we can uh, increase momentum and, and make progress accelerate. So uh, as we cent center now on the cancer area, you've seen these slides now over and over again. A wonderful presentation this morning from Dr. Dennis Deepin, another good colleague of mine, I hadn't seen him in a while, and, and his colleague. And, and then you see uh, Dr. Scarlett uh, Gomez here, whose uh, data I am showing with respect to liver cancer and stomach cancer rates in uh, AANHPI populations. So th this is the target for us. And then this is a slide I stole from jo Dr. Huang's a presentation from this morning, but you've seen this t over and over again that uh, Asian Americans of East Asian background, Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese, Chinese, are at particular risk for uh, stomach cancer incidents. So we are trying to do this the best way we can using the best data possible. Now taking advantage of disaggregated data, which is excellent, and then focusing with the best science and then trying to present it to prominent national groups that, like the US Preventive Services Task Force with, with the best collaboration, coordination, communication, and science we possibly can. What I can do for you, I think, is to, tr is to not only encourage you and be here today, but to, tr to add my perspective on how to make this go forward. Uh, I must say that one of the great joys of being in public health and public service is to work with people like Dr. Huang, his committee, and all of you. Uh, let me just mention two other groups that I hope can get involved in this. The Asian and Pacific Islander Health Forum is, is the oldest and largest health advocacy organization for a and HPI in the, in, the, in the country. I did talk to uh, Kathy Ko Chin, who's been the president and CEO for quite a while about this initiative, but, but apparently she could not come today, but I'm hoping you can work with the forum going forward. They're based in San Francisco, by the way. Uh, th this is a really strong and savvy advocacy group, and they were in D.C. all the time pushing for uh, health insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act, and look at the results, right? And then another group that I, I'm very, very proud of is the Association for Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APCHO. Uh, I think there are a couple dozen Asian-centered community health centers in the, in the country that's under the APCHO umbrella. And this is the executive director, Jeff Caballero, another great colleague and friend of mine uh, who I hope uh, can get involved in helping you because um, among many other things, community health centers uh, particularly reach out to, to, to low-income underserved people who, who need um, these efforts uh, just as much, if not more, than the, than the rest of the population. So that's a, a very quick overview, and as I end, here are some very high thoughts about how we can move forward. We need to uh, review the status of gastric cancer screening worldwide. You're doing that beautifully. Uh, some of these studies from this morning were very impressive. We're very pleased that because of the ACA and other efforts here in California and elsewhere, we're having more progress in disaggregated data by AA and HPI subgroups. That's great. Uh, Dr. Huang and colleagues and all of you are doing very important convening and connecting with advocates, policymakers, payers, and the media. Uh, the fact that you're already connected with the chair of a USPSTF is excellent. Keep it going. 
A collaboration with uh, NHPI serving institutions is important. It's very important to try to get the attention of congressional champions. Uh, here in California, you have Congresswoman Judy Chu, who heads the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Uh, she's an outstanding leader. I hope you can connect with her soon. Uh, I also have to mention former Congressman Mike Honda from California. He uh, stepped down from his office, but working closely with him was a great privilege for us and for me. And then supporting pilot studies and research going forward is, is critically important to keep the science at the highest level possible. So I end with this quote, which I think about almost every day from the WHO, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. I love that phrase, the highest attainable standard of health. Uh, like many of you, I got involved in this because I saw too many people dying from preventable cancer and preventable diseases. They didn't have a chance to live the highest attainable standard of health. If we can move closer to that goal through efforts like we're seeing here with respect to ga gastric cancer early detection, screening and prevention, uh, that will be a great victory. Thank you very, very much.